Hello and welcome everyone to this continuing part of our lecture series for the Trubensburg Conservatory of Fine Arts. My name is Mark Costa. I am the director of the Trubensburg Conservatory and I'm very happy to continue admitting the many people who are joining us this evening. And thank you. All of you are muted just so that you know. Uh, we will be having a question and answer period at the end of this presentation. So feel free to unmute yourself at the end. Um, let's see here. We have a few more people joining us. All right. Sounds good. Well, we have the time now and it is my pleasure to present Dr. David Peck, who is a postdoctoral associate at the Department of Entomology with Cornell University. And he has graciously agreed to share his time this evening in making a presentation entitled Dance with the Bees. Um, I'm going to turn things over to him. Uh, of course, I want to make sure that everybody is aware that the Trumansburg Conservatory of Fine Arts is also sponsored by NISCA and also the Tompkins County Chamber of Commerce for a part of our funding. We want to thank Bose and all of our corporate sponsors who have made this possible, as well as, most importantly, our board of directors and, of course, yourselves, yourselves. the supporters of the Trumansburg Conservatory. Thank you very much. And it is my pleasure to turn over this presentation to our presenter this evening, Dr. David Peck. Thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Mark, for your introduction. Uh, so if you'll bear with me for a moment while I share my screen, we should be able to, to get right into this. There we are. If, if Mark nods his head that everything seems to be looking good on, on that end, splendid. Then uh, we can get right into it. So, uh, as Mark said, uh, the title of my talk today is Dance with the Bees. Um, and what I want to talk to you about is the honeybee dance language, which took humanity thousands of years for us to actually be able to decode and understand. So this is something bees have been doing probably for millions of years, but we know that we noticed it thousands of years ago and couldn't explain it until very recently. Um, and so the question that many people probably ask themselves when they, when they come to the Trumansburg Conservatory is, how do I dance? People want to know how to dance. But as a behavioral biologist, I have been trained not so much to ask how questions, but to ask why questions. So I find it much more interesting to ask the question, why is something going to dance? Why are these people engaging in this sort of bizarre uh, activity with their bodies that has no, no obvious and immediate purpose. Uh, and so the questions I ask are things like, what is the function of this dancing behavior? What does it achieve? What is its purpose? And so when we look at human dancers, it's sometimes hard for us to figure that out. You know, what are these people doing and why are they doing it? Uh, so we can go around the world and we can see all different kinds of dancing that exist. So these are our Maasai warriors. Uh, and this dancing is largely, it's a social activity, but it's also a way to sort of show off and maybe impress, you know, a future romantic partner. And that's a very common use of dancing by human beings. Um, and so when we look around the world, it's not, you know, a few individual examples. Over and over again, we see these different cultures that have used dance for a lot of different purposes. Uh, when you go to areas where Sufi Islam is practiced, you can find uh, whirling dervishes, as they're, they're commonly called in English. These are people who are engaged in a very dance-like practice where they're actually really practicing a kind of religious meditation uh, during the, the process of going through these physical movements. Uh, we can look a lot more close to home. This is a photograph of a contradance uh, line where you've got a number of people who have gathered together to listen to music, to dance with each other, either partners that they brought or, or other folks who have joined the event. So this is very much a social activity that, that these dancers are engaging in. Uh, and then you have other things like ballroom dancing, which you know, in its current form exists as sort of a competitive uh, sport uh, for some people, but it's also very much an interaction between the, the two dance partners. And so we see this as an opportunity for, for people to interact on, on a close stage, but also to interact with sort of a, a broader audience that's around them. And so one thing that's very, very common, you know, it's not hard at all to find uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of places selling uh, placemats and, you know, refrigerator magnets that encourage people to dance like no one's watching. But what's really remarkable about that is that the vast majority of human dancing has an audience. And sometimes it's just an audience of, you know, you, the dancer, and the other individual that you're dancing with, but very often it has a larger audience. 
And sometimes it has a formal uh, artistic audience that have gathered to watch it. So you might see uh, people who have gathered to, to see some sort of a, a performance of interpretive dance. And in that case, the dance is being used for communication. That's the function of it. And so uh, interpretive dance can take a lot of different forms, but we call something interpretive dance when it's uh, intended to communicate something to the audience, something beyond just look at the way we move our bodies uh, on this stage. Uh, and so when we look at other more formalized uh, dance forms, we see things like ballet. I think this is taken from a, a performance of Swan Lake. We see that these dancers are, are trying to communicate something about the story with their bodies. They're, they're trying to tell something symbolically by the way they use their motion. And that's something that's really, really uh, pristinely demonstrated in the Polynesian dances that you see, the hula in Hawaii, and then related dances in other Polynesian cultures, where the, the people that engage in these dances are actually actively trying to tell a story through their motions. There are elements of sign language that become incorporated, and the movement of the body is really meant to communicate the story that the, the dancer is trying to tell. And so dance for communication is one of a number of ways that dance is used by human beings. Humans elaborated dancing. We've, we've used dance for a lot of different things, but we are not the inventors of dance. So we can look at our, some of our closest relatives. This is a gorilla uh, who's, who's dancing, uh, and, and why he's doing that is really only known to the gorilla, but it sure looks like the same kind of dance that I might do if I wanted to have fun in a pool. Um, this is Snowball, who's a very famous uh, uh, cockatoo who dances to whatever music is played in front of him. And so this is an animal that's engaging in this dance behavior, and he's doing it because of the, the music that he hears, uh, although the specific reasons are, are probably, again, only known to Snowball. Um, and if we, if we want to look at beyond Snowball to other birds, beyond these very smart parrots, we can find smart birds and not-so-smart birds who engage in all sorts of elaborate, complicated dance forms. And so uh, this is just, uh, just one bird of paradise out of many that engage in these complicated forms of dance. And it's not even just birds. It's not even just vertebrates. Uh, this is a, a peacock spider who is engaging in a dance, just like many humans do, in order to try to attract a mate. And so all of these different forms of animal dancing uh, lead us back to these questions. Why is this particular dance happening? What is the function of it? What does it achieve? And what is its purpose? And so what we're going to talk about today is that those questions uh, in the context of honeybee dancing. And so I'm going to talk to you about, about why honeybees dance and how honeybees dance over the course of this talk. And so I want to start with just one observation, um, which is that a few years ago, I filled up my hummingbird feeder and I took it outside. And about 25 minutes later, I went back outside to check something and it was absolutely covered in honeybees. I'm sure some of you have experienced something similar. Or maybe you took some, some you know, juice or, or um, uh, maybe soda outside and all of a sudden found yourself being mobbed by a, a whole big cluster of honeybees. And it's not really remarkable that a honeybee who spends her whole life going out looking for flowers and, and drinking uh, sugar water out of, out of those flowers is going to be interested in your hummingbird feeder. But what's really remarkable is how those hundreds of bees were able to find my hummingbird feeder in just a few minutes. And so that's something that, that that's really a problem that the honeybees have solved. And we need to figure out just what that problem is and then how they've solved it. And so the problem for a honeybee colony who might be kilometers, miles away from that hummingbird feeder is how do they find it quickly? And then how do they exploit all of the sugar in it before some other creature comes and takes advantage of it instead? Uh, and so when we like to think about landscapes, uh, certainly wild landscapes, you know, meadows and, and fields and things like that, we often as humans like to imagine that they're full of flowers. And those flowers are lovely and they might have a nice fragrance and, and surely the pollinators enjoy going and interacting with them. But the reality is most of our fields don't have flowers in them all the time. You know, a field of goldenrod is going to be full of flowers for the one week of the year that that goldenrod is blooming, and the rest of the time, it's not going to have anything. And so for honeybees, they have a really challenging problem of trying to find very, very patchy resources of, you know, flower nectar throughout their environment. And so it's even more complicated than just living in a landscape where there's not that many locations where you can find food. 
because there's also a time element to it. You can imagine that at some point in the year, maybe in the spring, all of these purple flowers are going to be producing lots of tasty nectar, but none of these other plants are ready yet. And then a week later, the purple flowers stop and the pink flowers start producing nectar. And then the bees might have to wait a month and save up that nectar and drink that until the yellow flowers start to produce. So this is a really, really complicated challenge and the survival of the honeybee colony depends upon being able to solve it well. Uh, and just to, to put into a little bit of context the range that these bees use while they're foraging for food, uh, we can do a little bit of math and we can say, well, if a honeybee is so long and a human is on average about this tall uh, and we take the average foraging radius for a honeybee colony, what would a, a human foraging radius look like? How far would we have to be looking for food around our homes in order for us to match the effort that the bees put into this? And when you do that math, you find out that it's more than a thousand kilometers. So if you're living in Ithaca, New York, you can imagine that you would be waking up in the morning and then looking for food uh, anywhere from Chicago to Nova Scotia to Charlotte, uh, North, uh, South Carolina, to the southern tip of James Bay up in Canada. And so that's the kind of range that these bees are covering while they're looking for food. But it's not just randomly walking around or flying around, sniffing different flowers and, and hoping that something has something tasty inside. Aristotle, in 330 BCE, uh, roughly, published a book called Historia Animalia. And from what we know of that book, uh, the, the fragments that have survived, we know that he talked about honeybees. And he talked about how bees recruit each other to different food sources. There's some recruitment mechanism going on. And then separate from that conversation, he also mentioned that the bees seemed to be engaging in some kind of dancing movement. They were moving their bodies in some you know, specific and particular way that he thought was noteworthy and that he wrote about. But he didn't connect those two ideas at all. And so over the course of the next, you know, more than 2,000 years, we just didn't know how it was that bees were able to find food in their environment. Until eventually the code was cracked by a scientist named Carl von Frisch. And so Carl von Frisch was, uh, started his honeybee work in 1919, uh, and then he won a Nobel Prize for that work in 1973. Uh, and it, it, it's perhaps interesting to note that uh, my PhD advisor's PhD advisor's PhD advisor was Carl von Frisch. Uh, and so uh, I, I am sort of scientifically descended from, from this decoder of the bee language. So here's what he did. He wanted to figure out how the bees were finding food. And so he trained honeybees to come to little glass feeders that he had filled with sugar water. And at first he thought the bees were probably using the smell of flowers or some other odor cue in order to figure out where good food sources were. But over time, as he was monitoring those bees, he started to pay more and more attention to these weird, curious little dances that the bees did. And he realized that the dances were very precise, and they had this very particular tempo and a very particular direction. When he was looking at these bees dancing on a, a comb of beeswax, they all seemed to be dancing in similar, in similar ways. And so he investigated further, and this is what he saw. So this is a video recording from my PhD advisor, Tom Seeley, uh, where we're going to look at some honeybees who are dancing. This clicks properly. Nope, let me, let me make sure that I've queued it up. There we are. So what you'll see in sort of the bottom center of the screen is a bee who's vibrating her body. And she's going to the left, and then she turns to the right, and then she vibrates again and turns to the left. And she goes back and forth this way, sort of forming a, a figure eight. But this wiggly back and forth part of this dance always happens in the same orientation. She's always going basically from right to left. And you can see that she's surrounded by an audience of other bees. They, they seem quite interested in what she's doing. So that's what Aristotle in 330 BCE, uh, all the way up until Carl von Frisch in 1919 thought was this curious dancing that bees did, maybe to show that they were excited or to indicate that, that they were, you know, that they had found food or, or that they were happy to be home, who knows. But what he did was he designed some experiments and I'm gonna talk about just a few of them uh, and, and show you the evidence that he found. So the first question he wanted to ask was, maybe that dance is communicating something about the direction that, that the food is, is stored in. And so what he did was he, he trained a bunch of bees living in a hive to go to a feeder, which in this picture is labeled F. Uh, and so the bees were going to that feeder and going home and going to the feeder and going home. And then all of these other little dots arranged in this diagram with the numbers next to them, all of those dots were other feeders that were empty. 
And what Carl von Frisch did was he, all of a sudden, when he had bees that were going to, to F, he filled all of those feeders up with food. And the food was all the same quality, same concentration of sugar, and it had the same odor added to it. So it was, it was pretty noticeable to a bee flying by. They should have been able to find it. But what he observed after that is that the feeder that was in the same direction as feeder F, the, that was somehow being communicated by the bees that had already found feeder F, seemed to be recruiting a lot more bees to fly in that direction than they flew in the other directions towards the other feeders. So these numbers are just the number of bee who have, has arrived at each of those feeders. I think this was after maybe one half hour uh, of, of observation time. And so that tells us that these bees are actually recruiting uh, other bees and pointing out a direction somehow. The other thing he tested was whether the bees could communicate distance. And he did something very similar. He put out feeders at 200 meters, 400 meters, 700, 800, 1,000 meters, one and a half kilometers away, two kilometers away, two and a half kilometers away. All of those feeders, just like in before, were empty while he trained bees to go to a feeder that was exactly 750 meters from the hive. And then all at once, him and his, uh, his graduate students filled up all of those feeders uh, along that line with this scented sugar water solution. And then they monitored how many bees showed up. And what they found, once again, was that the bees that had never been to a feeder before were almost always going to the feeder that was either 700 or 800 meters away. They were, in, for some reason, they were being told exactly how far they were supposed to fly to a feeder that they had never encountered. And so they were going to these other nearby ones uh, occasionally by mistake. And so he learned that these bees were somehow communicating distance, direction, uh, and he also found that, that they were doing something more during the dance. In between those little bouts out on the dance floor, sometimes the dancer would turn to her audience and she would actually touch tongues with them. And so what he believed was that they were actually regurgitating, they were vomiting up these samples of whatever food she had in, stored inside her body. And by doing that, the smell and the taste of whatever food she was dancing about uh, was going to be communicated to those other bees. And so Carl von Frisch very specifically looked at those bees and he described the choreography that they were using. These dancers were doing two different kinds of dance. He found that when the food source was very close to the hive, within about 50 meters, they did what he called the round dance. And the steps of that are pretty straightforward. The bee goes sort of forward and, or, and you know, up to, to one point then turns right back, back around and then goes in a little circle until she meets that point again. And will sometimes keep going in a circle and will sometimes sort of restart and go back and go left and go right. So what that communicated, it seemed, was that the food was nearby and they would also share the flavor of it with the, the audience so they could find it. But the much more interesting and sophisticated dance is what he called the waggle dance. The waggle dance is what happened when the food was more than 50 meters away. And what he found was that the bees would move in this figure eight that I've already shown you in that video. They would buzz and walk, waggle their bodies back and forth, going in some direction. And then they would turn to the right and walk in a little circle. And then when they got back to the start, they would buzz in the exact same direction. And then they would turn to the left until they came back. And they would continue doing that over and over and over again, going in that little circle and always buzzing in the same uh, direction. And so what he noticed was that one individual bee would always be doing that dance in one particular direction uh, on the comb, but the different bees would dance in different directions, sometimes up, sometimes down, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. And so by studying it further, what he decoded, what he determined, is that the angle that that bee dances relative to the vertical straight up and down, because of course inside their hive, all they have is, you know, they can feel that where up is and where down is, they can feel gravity. When that bee was dancing on her hive uh, a little bit off to the right, that would communicate to the other bees who were watching her that if they flew outside and looked at the sun, if they turned that same little bit to the right and then flew the correct distance, they would find whatever patch of flowers that bee had been dancing about. And so what that means is that the bees are actually encoding in their dance the position of the flowers that they're dancing about. It means that the angle between where the sun currently is on the horizon and where a bee needs to fly to find new flowers is the same as the angle between a straight up and down line 
and the angle that that bees waggle dance is predictably running in. And so this is a very sophisticated and remarkable communication system that these bees use, and it's all communicated through this dance. Uh, and there's more to that. He also realized that by moving feeders to different angles and different locations, he found out that the number of waggle runs, uh, sorry, the number of waggles per run, or the amount of time that that little wiggling takes place in a given dance, corresponded to how far away the food was. So if they dance for about a second, then the food is about one kilometer away. And if you take a feeder and put it three kilometers away, you'll suddenly find that your bees are dancing for about three seconds in each of those little runs before they turn left or turn right so that they can restart it. And so you've got the scout bee who found that food and comes back to dance, and then all of these recruits waiting around in the hive who follow that dance and then go off to, to collect food that the scout has reported. And that's the way that the bees found my hummingbird feeders so quickly. Um, and then uh, this is just an interesting fun note that um, many years after Carl von Frisch's work, we finally developed the technology to make uh, radar transponders small enough that we could glue them to the backs of bees. That's what you can see on the left there. And what we find is that the bees, if we track them using radar, do exactly what Carl von Frisch said. They go to exactly the feeders that have been communicated by their sisters dancing in that hive. And so what I'd like to do now is, is just do a little bit of test to make sure that you understand what we've talked about. I want to see if you can decode the waggle dance. So I'm not going to make anyone stand up and, and move your bodies. You don't have to do the dancing, but we're going to act like we're the audience bees. We're the bees who are, who are listening or watching this dance, trying to figure out where we're supposed to go for food. So again, remember that the relationship is that a, a the angle between a vertical straight up and down dance, a dance that goes upwards, uh, and then uh, uh, the, the angle that that bee has actually taken is the same as the angle between where the sun is relative to the hive and where the flowers can be found. And so with a little practice, I, I hope that will make more sense. So why don't we start this way? And I wanna ask you to, to play along at home and just try to decode what this bee is going to be doing. So, here we are in our hive, and we have a bee who's flown out. She flew in the direction of the sun, and she found a very nice flower. When she goes home, where is she going to dance in order to tell her sisters where to find the food that she's looking for? So we remember that if the angle relative to vertical is the angle relative to the sun. And so what that tells us is that if the flower is in the exact same direction as the sun, when this bee comes home, she's going to dance straight up. When she does those waggle runs, they're all going to be going directly upwards. And then she'll turn right or turn left so that she can get back to the beginning and redo her dance that way. So how about this case where the bee flew out and then she flew away from the sun and she went on a straight line until she found a nice flower and then she's going to come back and report that to her sisters in the hive. What's that bee going to do? Well, because it's exactly opposite from the sun, it means that she's going to be dancing straight downwards every time she does one of those waggle dances. So it gets a little more complicated when we start adding angles relative to the sun. So let's look at this case. The bee flies out, she knows that the sun is off in one direction, and then she flies 120 degrees to the right of that direction. So if the, the sun is to the southeast, this bee is going to fly west, find a flower, and come home to report it. In what direction is she going to dance? Well, using our code here, we know that that bee is going to dance 120 degrees to the right of going straight up. And so she'll be dancing down and to the right. If instead of going east, she had, sorry, west, she had gone east, where is she going to dance? Well, she's going to be dancing not to the right of vertical, but to the left of vertical by the corresponding angle. So the last one that I'd like you to, to practice with me is let's look at this B again and figure out what it is that she's communicating. What is she pointing to with her dance? It looks to me like she's going more or less straight left, maybe a little bit, a little bit further down on each of those runs than if she was going straight, you know, flat to the left. So what that tells me is that if, a, if I was leaving this cluster, I was leaving this hive, 
and I was going out to follow her dance, I would look at the sun, wherever it happens to be, and then I would turn left by about 90 degrees, and that's the direction that I would fly in order to find whatever it is that she's dancing about. So you might ask yourself, well, doesn't the sun move in the sky? And uh, what's really fascinating is that a bee might go out and find a really great source of food and then come back and start her dance. But she might dance for a period of an hour or two hours to communicate to everyone else in the hive, hey, I've got this really great food source, you should go check it out. And so because she's able to, uh, because she's going to be in there for a period of an hour or more, the sun's position on the horizon is actually going to change a little bit. And so what's really remarkable about these bee dances is that they change their choreography as time passes. They actually adjust the angle that they dance at so that when the, the new bee, an hour after this dance begins, looks at it and decodes it and interprets what's being pointed to, it's still going to be pointing in the same direction based on how far the sun has moved in the sky over the course of that hour. So that's just one you know, little taste of this absolutely remarkable dance that these bees engage in. What Carl von Frisch discovered, what he proposed and then demonstrated with a lot of really great science, is that when bees are dancing, it's not just to show that they're excited, like Aristotle thought. It's not just because they're weird little bugs, like some beekeepers have thought for years. It's that they are using this really complicated symbolic communication. They are saying, go in this direction, go precisely this distance, here's what it smells like, here's what it tastes like, and the longer that they dance, if they dance for three hours, it's because they found a three hour good food source. If a bee comes back and does two or three dances and then gives up, it's probably because she knows the food source isn't that good. So they're communicating direction, distance, quality, taste, and smell all through this dance form. And so, uh, that is the fascinating biology of these bees and the fascinating way that they engage in this dance behavior. Uh, but the other thing that I'd like to talk about with you today uh, before we get to questions is how you can help these fascinating animals. What can we do to help honeybees and to help other bees uh, living these fascinating rich lives? And so one thing that I should explain right from the get-go is you've probably seen in the news that honeybees have a lot of problems, that there are a lot of things going wrong in the world of honeybees and that they need our help. And in one sense, it, it, things aren't quite as dire as the news likes to, likes to describe it as. When the news comes out and says all of the honeybees are dying and we won't be able to make any food, that's not really accurate. So this is a graph that just shows you the, an estimate of the number of honeybee hives in the world over time. And what you can see is that over the, the last, what's this, 20 some years, uh, or 30 years it looks like, um, there have, we've actually increased the number of hives that have existed in the world. From about 70 million, we've gone up to somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 million. So in that sense, the, bees aren't all, the honeybees aren't all going extinct right away. But there are still very serious problems. So this is just one of a number of graphs that, that if we look at it and interpret it, tells us that the number of bees that are, honeybees that are dying in the United States every year is simply too high. So in this diagram, uh, you, we see three different kinds of bars. They're the gray bars, the light yellow bars, and then the orange bars. The light yellow bars, or sorry, the, the gray bars, are the acceptable winter losses that these beekeepers are able to tolerate. That when they estimate how many bees they need, how many bees they have, what they can afford to do in order to keep, them, uh, keep their bees healthy and keep their, their beekeeping business profitable, that's the number of bees that they can afford to lose. Those light yellow bars are how many they actually lose every winter. And so what you can see is that since 2006, for as long as this data has been collected, we see that those beekeepers are losing more hives than they can really afford. And the way they deal with that is that every spring, the few bees that do survive in their big, you know, healthy hives are going to get split up into a whole bunch of little hives. And the bees are forced to then rebuild and regrow so that the beekeeper can make honey and then get ready for the next winter where they also expect that they're going to lose more bees than they can really afford. And so honeybees are struggling, but not in exactly the dire way that the news media talks about. But it's not just honeybees that are species of concern. 
So we have the, this, uh, this case here of a number of different North American bumblebee species. And what this chart shows us is that over time, when we look for bumblebee species like Bombus occidentalis or, or Bombus bimaculatus, all of these different species, what we find is that the number of observations that, that we can make, the number of scientific entomological specimens that have been found and reported over time are going down. And that as we try to estimate where these bees live, we see that their ranges are shrinking faster and faster and faster. And so if we look at just one species, this is a species of great conservation concern called Bombus affinis. This is the rusty patch bumblebee. What we find is in the dark there on that map of the United States, you can see the historic range of these bees. But if you look at the number of observations, the number of individuals that have been found by scientists since 2002, what we find is that in fact, their range has very dramatically shrunk. These bees are supposed to be living in Ithaca, New York, but in fact, we don't see them here anymore. And it's not just a problem in the United States. If we look at uh, another native bee species, a bumblebee living in the United Kingdom, what you find is that when they started collecting and recording specimens in 1800, all the way up until 1980, these bees were being found all over the United Kingdom. But when you look at the number of specimens that have been found from the year 2000 to 2014, they were only found in the farthest northern reaches of Scotland. So what we see is that the, the areas where we find these native bee species are shrinking. And they're shrinking for a number of reasons. And for uh, many of those, there's something that you can do to try to help them. So the three specific steps that I recommend to you, if you wanna save honeybees and also these native bee species, are that you want to reduce or control their exposures to pesticides. You wanna do whatever you can to fight climate change. And you want to engage in what we call pollinator-friendly gardening. And I'm gonna to talk to you about each of these steps that I recommend. So the first of them is controlling the bees' exposure to pesticides. Where do these pesticides come from? Well, they're being applied on lawns, they're being applied to crops. Some pesticides are actually applied by beekeepers to their bees. The red line that you can see here, which is labeled miticide, is used to kill a parasitic mite on the honeybees. But what this table shows us is the 13 most common uh, non-bee created compounds that you find on honeybees that visit apple orchards in New York State. And what we see is that there are insecticides, there are herbicides, there are lots and lots of fungicides that are sprayed generally on those apples to keep them from spoiling. Uh, and there's this miticide that's used actually as a medication for the bees. So all of these compounds are found inside these, these colonies and they're found at levels that can, that can reduce their ability to uh, survive, they can do harm to the bees. And specifically, we know that a number of these pesticides can actually make it so that the bees either don't dance as much or when they do dance, they dance less accurately. So a bee might come back if she's been exposed to pesticides and, and say, well, I found some food, I'm going to point you towards it, but she might dance for too many seconds, or she might point at the wrong angle relative to the sun. And so her sisters who are trying to make enough money that they can survive the winter might instead find themselves um, uh, unable to, to uh, locate whatever food source is being described because we know that these pesticides make the bees less effective at dancing. Uh, another really important factor, which is obviously not something that any one of us can change, but something that we all have to be very concerned about, is climate change. And what we, what we see over and over again with honeybees, with bumblebees, and in fact with really all species that ecologists study, is that if we don't control climate change, if the climate continues to warm and, and uh, alter itself in different areas, what we're going to find is that we will not see the same species in areas that we used to see them. They, in, some sense, in some species, we're just going to see that they move further and further north. But in other cases, we might actually see some of these species go extinct. Because it's not just that things get a little bit hotter, so species that like to live at 30 degrees move, you know, move a few uh, hundred miles north and then are happy at a 30 degree temperature because the temperature swings in a changing climate world can still be enough to maybe kill the eggs that these bees are laying or prevent the flowers that they need uh, to, eat on, to feed on from germinating appropriately. 
And so the more the climate change uh, changes, the more difficulty some sensitive species are going to have to adapt. So it's likely that no matter how the climate changes, honeybees will still be around. Humans have a, a lot of incentive to keeping honeybees alive. But these other bumblebee species and other native bees don't have the same advocates. Uh, and so in order to conserve them, we need to get climate change under control. And the last and maybe, maybe most immediately uh, alterable by most people um, factor that impacts the health of these bees is that habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and habitat simplification all threaten the lives of honeybees and other bee species. And so what we can see here are really standard images of human uh, colonization of wildlife. Oops. Uh, and so the, the first of these in the upper left, we see a mowed lawn. We also see that in parks on the right and, and below. On the left, we see urban sprawl, where its subdivisions have expanded and grown and grown and grown, taking over what was previously unmodified habitat. And on the right, we see a field of cropland from the sky. And it's very much like these, these uh, subdivisions that we see on the left. When we take a field that had previously contained a large number of different plant species or a forest, and instead we clear all of that and plant just one species, something like corn or soy, the bees are often unable to get any food from them at all because uh, plants like corn are not pollinated by bees, they're pollinated by the wind. And so the pollen that they make is not well suited to the bees and the bees aren't well suited to collect it. And so uh, if we plant something like corn or soy, the bees won't be able to get it. And even if we do plant species that bees can collect nectar or pollen from, often those crops are going to be sprayed with pesticides. So that brings us back to issue number one. And so by reducing this habitat fragmentation, by reducing the habitat loss, and by reducing the oversimplification of a field of wildflowers to simply a field of grass, you can help keep bees alive. And so that brings me to this idea of pollinator-friendly gardening that I recommend. What we suggest that people do is, is take the following steps. First of all, use a wide variety of plants so that the plants in your garden are going to bloom from early spring into very late fall. And that's because uh, these bees that are collecting nectar or pollen aren't going to be able to, to get a great benefit if you plant a whole bunch of one species that blooms for a week in July and then doesn't produce any more food for the rest of the year. And so your garden is going to serve pollinators better and you'll have more pollinators that you get to see if you've got a lot of different plants that are blooming all the way over the course of the year. Native pollinators in particular are going to do a lot better if you plant native plants. So when you're selecting plants for your, your location, for your garden, make sure that you're picking plants that are native and, and haven't been brought over by European colonists in the last few hundred years. The other thing that's related to that is that when you choose your species, don't get modern hybrid flowers that have been bloom, uh, bred to produce giant, beautiful blooms, uh, particularly flowers that, that are described as doubled. The problem there is that just like the tomatoes that you can buy in your grocery store, those flowers are bred so that they're beautiful for humans to look at and so that human industry, the flower industry or the tomato shipping industry, are able to, to make a lot of profit by, by producing something that doesn't get damaged. But they're not being bred for taste and they're not being bred for nutrition. So for us, that means that our winter tomatoes often don't taste very good. For the bees, it means that if you plant a bunch of beautiful roses and other hybrid modified flower species, they might look really nice to you. They might attract the attention of the bees, but there won't be anything in those flowers for the bees to harvest and take home. You should also make sure that whenever possible, you eliminate pesticides in your own uh, land. If that's a small garden, if it's a, a potted plant on your porch, or if it's you know, a big field that you manage or even a farm. If you can reduce the pesticides that you use, that's great. If you can eliminate the pesticides, that's even better. But if you do need to apply some kind of pesticide, make sure that you're spraying it at night when the honeybees aren't going to be active, when no bees will be active, bees only come out during the day, or uh, make sure that you're reading whatever labels and you're not overdosing your plant with this pesticide. It might not kill the plant, but it could greatly increase the risk to the insects in the area if they do get exposed to it. If you have uh, species that are not bees that you're trying to manage, because we, we care about all pollinators, um, make sure that you're growing any plants that the, that the larvae, the babies of those pollinators need in order to reproduce. So if you want to have butterflies in your garden, 
figure out what their caterpillars eat and then grow that as food for them. When you see caterpillars, don't you know, shake them off or spray them off or, or spray a pesticide. Allow those caterpillars to eat the plants so that then you will have all of the pollinating butterflies that, that they mature into. And the last and really important thing for a lot of native bee species is spare that limb, is don't clear all of the dead wood out of your landscape. Don't clear all of the leaf litter. Don't clear any you know, rotting you know, bark or, or mulch. And certainly don't get rid of all of the, the old dead logs because there are a very large number of bee species that actually reproduce inside those logs. They'll, they'll dig little holes and they'll lay their eggs inside that habitat. And so if you leave that in your garden, it's going to allow those native species to grow and, and reproduce there. So those are the things that I recommend. Control pesticide exposure, do your best to fight climate change, and then be a pollinator-friendly gardener if you garden at all. But the thing that I don't automatically recommend to people is that you, I don't automatically say, go and get a honeybee hive. They're absolutely wonderful. They make wonderful honey. It's a great hobby. Um, and you can certainly you know, take care of your bees and, and you'll be helping them by taking good care of them. But I don't recommend that people go and buy a beehive just because bees have this fascinating dance language because that's often not the best way to take care of them. But planting a garden is going to be a better way to do it unless you're willing to take some classes, work with a mentor and learn how to be a, a competent and qualified beekeeper. So don't order your bees today unless you were already thinking about it. And if you do order bees, make sure that you're, you're taking the appropriate steps in order to be able to, um, to, to take appropriate care of them. Uh, so with that, I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Um, I'll, I'll do whatever I can for the remaining time. And it looks like we've got, got plenty of time to talk about some of these topics. Uh, but I, I have also put my email up there. If anyone would like to, to send me an email, we can certainly correspond that way as well. Um, so I guess in the interest of, of maybe getting to see people, I'll stop sharing my, my slides, but then if you, if you want me to pull it back up again, just let me know what, you, what diagram or graph you want to see and I can, I can do so. Thank you so much, Dr. Peck. I really appreciate it. We do have a starter question from Barbara Harrison. She asks, sure. I have put up bee boxes with water and there are native plants also over. I've not had luck in attracting mason bees for the two seasons that I've put up the boxes. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts? Yeah, so that, that mason bees are, are one of these wonderful native bee species that, that are great pollinators and are really, really nice uh, to have around. That sort of gets to the, the point I was trying to make when I, I brought up climate change, is that, is that if the climate suddenly shifts and the, the right habitat for those bees moves 200 miles to the north, the problem is if there aren't any bees there to start, they're not going to thrive in that new habitat. And so it sounds like you've taken every step that you could in order to make great mason bee habitat, but maybe there just aren't any in the area that have found them. So I know that one thing specifically with those mason bees that you can do is you can actually order them. Uh, and, and there are companies that will ship you mason bees uh, often in, in little nests that, that you keep in the refrigerator until spring. And if you introduce that population, it's very likely that they're going to, to take hold in this great habitat you've built and then you'll see them going forward in the future. Thank you. Yep, wonderful. We have another question that's come in from John Henderson asking about cloud cover affecting the bee dance. It absolutely does not, but that's an excellent question. And, and if I pull my slides back up, I should be able to show you why. Give me, uh, bear with me one moment while I, I play with my technology here uh, because I have some slides to that effect. Um, so uh, the question is, if these bees are using the sun, how on earth do they navigate on a cloudy day? And the answer is, da, 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 da. let's see if this works. The answer is, how do these bees navigate when it's cloudy? Well, it's that honeybees aren't actually looking directly at the sun. What they're looking at is the polarization of light around the sun. Mm. And so we don't need to get into the, the complicated physics of all of this. But what's happening here is that when a honeybee looks at, the, uh, looks at a whole bunch of clouds, they're able to figure out precisely where the sun is. Because even though the clouds sort of block the visible circle of the sun, the way that light comes out of that sun and hits our atmosphere sort of has a, a, a vector to it. It has this angle to it. And honeybee eyes are much more sophisticated than ours in this way. They're able to see the polarization of light and it allows them to, to look at a cloudy, you know, totally white or gray sky 
and say, aha, I know that the sun is over there because all of the lines that I see in my, in my polarization filters, all, everything I can see in my eye is telling me that that's the precise location of the sun. It's an excellent question. <laughs> it's so good that I prepared slides about it. <laughs> it certainly is. And that, that is a fascinating topic. Thank you so much for the question. Um, uh, I, I hope you will indulge me in, in one question as well, could you? Certainly. Um, I, I was curious, has there been any further research into whether or not the dance communication um, uh, communicates any other information about the health of the colony, uh, the, the health of the queen, or any other um, uh, particular specifics about the bees? So the, the dance language that I've described, the waggle dance, um, certainly can be modified by a, a number of different things. It's typically not going to tell you very much about the queen or the genetic health, but pesticide exposure or also nutritional problems uh, definitely manifest that way. It's such a precise communication mechanism. You know, you can imagine if you had a, a ballet recital, but the day before the performance, you know, the, there was a big blizzard and so no food could get to the ballerinas for a day. <laughs> they might be able to go through the steps, but it, it's not going to be the same performance. Um, and so it, it, related to that is this other, this other interesting note, which is that it's not just the, these waggle dances that bees use to communicate. They dance in other ways. Uh, and so they have something called the shaking dance or the shaking signal. They have a grooming dance that they will sometimes do that invites another worker to come over and, and groom them. And that's really helpful with these parasitic mites that the honeybees deal with, is they will actually engage in this little grooming dance and that says, hey, I'm having some trouble reaching you know, the small of my back. Can one of my sisters please come and, and help me out? And they engage in these other signals. We call them stop signals or whooping signals. And they, they have an acoustic component. There's a sound element to them but they also have this very physical interaction where they'll either grapple with another bee or they'll just move their own bodies on the comb. Uh, and so these other behaviors, there's something else that we call buzzing runs where bees will actually run in a line uh, through the colony to say, hey, I think it's time for us to get ready and, and fly out in a swarm and, and go try to find a new nest site. And so they engage in all of these different things, some of which I think are very appropriately called dances in addition to the, the dance language. And so all of those things tell us something about what's happening in the hive. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. Um, we have a very specific question about beekeeping um, from mm -hmm. Adele. I've had a mason box up for two years. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what do you think about using liquid borax for ant control around hives? Ah, um, yes. If you've got beehives, uh, and that can actually be native bee nests that you put up or honey beehives, um, one concern that people sometimes have is that ants are going to get in and they're going to fight the bees and steal the honey and so you want to use, use something like liquid borax is, is one of a number of, of things that can be applied that will help to keep the ants down. Liquid borax is a lot better than a synthetic pesticide that you might spray. Uh, that can certainly get up into the bees if they come down and drink some water from, from near the bottom of the hive, so that's better. Um, but I would also say if you have a healthy bee colony, you probably don't have to worry about ants. The honeybees are very good at defending what they've collected from nature. And they, they collect you know, huge, huge quantities, gallons and gallons and gallons of nectar, and then evaporate it by fanning their wings to produce this nice concentrated sugar solution that we call honey. And so they're not gonna let ants wander in and steal that from them. Bees have been fighting ants for a lot longer than bees have been living in boxes made by people. Um, and so you may not need to take any steps at all, and, and you can just trust your bees to take care of it. But if you do, liquid borax is a better choice than, than spraying some kind of a, an ant-killing pesticide around your hive. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, another interesting question is about the, uh, the spread of technology, specifically certain radio frequency communications. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that might affect honeybee navigation? Yes. So when, when the phenomenon that we now call colony collapse disorder was identified, uh, maybe a decade or a decade and a half ago, what we thought was, you know, something is killing these honeybees and we don't know what it is. And um, subsequent research has told us that it's actually a combination of things. It's partially to blame on pesticides, 
it's partially to blame on parasitic mites and, and the diseases that they transmit to the bees. It's partially to blame on nutritional problems that the bees are exposed to. So it's a lot of different factors at once that lead to this thing that we call colony collapse disorder. But there was this hypothesis that maybe, you know, 4G radio signals, and then when 5G came out, maybe 5G radio signals were contributing to it. Before any of that specifically, people just thought, well, maybe the, the microwaves that are blasted out by these cell phone towers could be contributing to navigation problems. And so a lot of scientific research was done on that subject. And I am pretty confident saying that all of that evidence has come back and said, whatever effects these may have on other species, they are not affecting honeybees. Honeybee navigation is not meaningfully altered by you know, cell phone signals or, or anything like that. It was a very good hypothesis. A lot of very respectable scientists did some very respectable science, but it turns out that it's not affecting honeybees in any real meaningful way. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Well, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to jump in. We've reached the end of our list here and we have a little bit more time. So feel free to uh, go ahead and chime in with any. Barbara, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. On that graph that you showed of the winter loss and then total loss, the yes. total loss in I think 2012, 2013, that was very, very high. Why in that year in particular? Yeah. The so it, there, yeah. there are a couple of different ways that we can explain that. So the question is, so the, the light yellow bar is the winter loss. That's, that's these bees that are killed either by, you know, cold or starvation or by diseases that really hit them hardest in the winter. Uh, but then the other, the other notable thing there is this orange bar, which is the total annual loss. Uh, and so the difference between the total annual loss, that's how many colonies these beekeepers had die in a year, and the winter loss, which is the light yellow, is going to be the bees that died in the spring, summer, and fall, when normally you don't see very many bees dying at all. Um, that is going to be partially attributed to uh, pesticide exposures, and, and I think part of the reason that's gone down a bit, the, the difference between those bars, is that people who apply some of these bee-harming pesticides have, have been taught what they were doing wrong and how to do better. Um, and I think part of it is also that, that uh, certain beekeeping practices that people used to be able to get away with when the bees weren't being hit from so many different directions by so many different stressors, uh, suddenly just started compounding so badly that, that a lot of bees were dying. And so what wound up happening is a lot of beekeepers have actually changed some of their management practices, and that has also helped to, to shrink that. Um, but, but that, yeah, that, that certainly, is included in these conversations that we have about you know, evidence of, of unexpected colony loss or colony collapse disorder. Um, but uh, it's not the primary loss, as you can see, of bees. So, you know, we, we expect to see them dying in the winter most of the time, and most of them do die in the winter. And those winter losses are still too high. So that's really the, the main target. And then these other, these other sort of more, more fluked, uh, flukish um, events are, are considered lower priority until we get the winter losses under at the very least. Thank you, Dr. Peck. And just to let you know, you're, you're a very good teacher. You're, <laughs> Thank the you. you the, the presentation, the way you explain things and your images, really, really excellent. So I, I just want to share that with you for a layperson. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's, it's been excellent listening to you. We all really appreciate it. We've had a few more questions come in, and we do have enough time. Sure. Uh, from Glory June Grief asks, I try to keep my hive entirely organic. What do you think about using oxalic acid mist for the treatment of mites? Yeah, so we're getting into some, some much less dance related and more technical beekeeping related questions. So I hope everyone who isn't a beekeeper will bear with us. Um, oxalic acid is something that you can use to kill these parasitic mites that I was talking about. Um, and the reason we use uh, what are called the organic acids, oxalic acid or formic acid, which is the same chemical that, that gives ants their, their sting, um, is because both formic acid and oxalic acid are actually found in small quantities in honey. Uh, and so it's considered something that bees can, can deal with at least on a fundamental level, although obviously the dosages can, can still be toxic. Um, so this mist, this, what, what you're describing as mist is really a vaporization. You take a, like a car battery and a heating element and some crystallized acid, you put that inside the, the hive and you heat it up and it sort of all evaporates and then settles on all the surfaces. 
I've used that in hives before. My bees are, are perfectly happy and healthy, uh, and it does kill the parasites. So I recommend that as a, a perfectly reasonable and appropriate um, uh, bee treatment uh, if you want to get these parasites under control. And I do recommend treating for these parasitic mites whenever you can. Wonderful, wonderful. We have one more question about habitat mm -hmm. um, that I think we can get to before the hour. Uh, sure. It's from Gail Shapiro. Uh, so would you say it would still be good to put up bee houses with different size bamboo pieces for them? Or is it more important to make a habitat of native plants and to not cut down those plants until late spring or early summer? Uh, I would say that both are, are <laughs> certainly important. Uh, and I'd recommend that people do both. So the idea of hanging up these, these little hollow bamboo tubes is so that it provides these tubes that certain bee species like to nest in. And they do very well in, in bamboo or other kinds of tube. Uh, and so I recommend that. Uh, and you want to hang not just different sizes of bamboo, but you also want to hang them at different heights. Because we know that some species will like to go into a tube relatively low to the ground, some of them would like to be way up, you know, under the eaves of your house. And so I recommend that if possible, you hang or, or position these, these little tubes in various locations. Um, but uh, it's also very important that you're growing habitat. And, and these bees are hit by so many different stressors. I would say do whatever you can and do as much as you can in order to help them. So if you can, if you can grow a pollinator-friendly garden, but also provide nesting habitat, I'd say go ahead and do both. That's wonderful. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. Thank you again, Dr. David Peck, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I was looking forward to this greatly myself, and I can tell from the audience's response as we're getting in from the claps and the thank yous, this has been excellent. I would also like to let everyone who's in attendance know that we have a follow-up presentation, um, not coincidentally titled Sing with the Birds, uh, working with the issue of uh, vocalization for birds. And that is going to be happening on March 7th, again at 6 p.m., with uh, Dr. Samantha Caruso Peck, a familiar last name, yes? Who is not, not so coincidentally my wife, but a very well, well qualified and accomplished uh, ornithologist who, who's going to have a great time talking to you as well. Absolutely. And of course, before we get there on February 27th, the Trimsburg Conservatory of Fine Arts is very proud to present a premiere presentation of Songs of Separation which is Jeff Peterson's um, newest release. He has created a uh, Black History Month presentation that features some traditional works as well as some modern works. Uh, this is a, a world premiere presentation that we will be introducing on February 27th at 7 p.m. So I hope you can all join us for that as well. And of course, on March 7th for Sing With The Birds. Um, again, my name is Mark Costa, the director of the Trumansburg Conservatory. Dr. Peck, thank you all for coming this evening, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Take care.